Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neofusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neofusionism. Neofusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So, for today's episode, we'll be looking at a book called The Cave and the Light, Plato versus Aristotle and the Struggle for the Soul of Western Civilization. This book is by Arthur Herman, and it was written in 2013, so it is fairly recent among the various books that I have reviewed. And what is interesting about this book is is that it enables us to take the uh, idea that we've been working with over the past few episodes of uh, which was which was very clearly laid out in the conflict of visions of this dichotomy between different ways of viewing the world uh, the constrained vision viewing the world as uh, as he, basically saying that human beings have a certain way about them uh, and that our societies uh, have to conform to our human nature, I guess. And uh, and then the unconstrained vision that would say that we don't have that kind of constraint and that we're, we're essentially plastic, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase is plasticity, uh, that, that we're, we have the capability of, of molding ourselves or being molded uh, in, in any number of, of different manners. And so that we can create the society, whatever kind of society we want to create, if we have the willpower to do so. We looked at that uh, same sort of dichotomy in the last episode when we looked at the great debate between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, and Edmund Burke uh, exemplifying a constrained vision and Thomas Paine exemplifying an unconstrained vision. Um, uh, But that book looks a little bit more at Thomas Paine's uh, approach to individualism and Edmund Burke's approach to human beings as embedded within pre-existing communities and uh, intergenerational lineages, uh, but it's still along the same lines of, of of people are constrained by their given circumstances, and those given circumstances need to be taken into account and should be. Um, should be worked with rather than uh, the Thomas Paine slash modern progressive approach that the constraints within which we are born uh, are to we are we are we are attempting to liberate ourselves from nature and from the given circumstances of our lives and so in in any in the any extent to which we are not completely unconstrained. Uh, we need to become unconstrained through through um, through liberating ourselves thusly, and so this book is interesting because it 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 kind of looks to say can we track back this sort of dichotomy in in some form or another, all the way back to antiquity, uh, back and we and we can in a way tra- track that back to Plato and Aristotle. Now it's not going to be exactly the same uh, sort of dichotomy that you might see in the modern say, right versus left. You know, you're talking about well over 2,000 years ago. It's going to look a little bit different back then than it does now. But uh, there are fundamental concepts in the conflict or the dispute between Plato and Aristotle that we can see again and again coming up through Western civilization right up to the present moment. And that's what this book does. It basically lays out the difference between these two men But then it walks us all the way through the history of Western civilization up to the present and keeps coming back to these two different viewpoints, an Aristotelian viewpoint and a Platonic viewpoint. Um, And that could be rephrased as an empirical viewpoint, which is the Aristotelian, or a rationalist viewpoint, which is the Platonic. Um or a realist versus idealist, uh, it's the same sort of dichotomy. And it, this is really interesting to be able to 
to kind of dig back to the roots of this conflict. Now, can it be tracked back beyond that? Maybe, but you start getting at the bounds of recorded history if you go too far back in time. Um, and, and it's not necessarily able to be discerned in the same clear manner. So, um, of course, I'm going to follow my typical format. I'm going to read some significant sections of this book to you. Now, keep in mind, this book is a total of, uh, let me just get my final count here. This book is a total of a, about 570 pages. So, um, I am skipping out huge sections of this book. Um, only really reading little bits and pieces of it that I find most relevant to our conversation. I am much more an Aristotelian in, in my own viewpoint and in my own temperament. And, um, uh, kind of what I'm advocating for is a much more Aristotelian perspective. And so I'm going to give a little bit more attention to Aristotle than I do to Plato, and a little bit more attention to uh, times when Aristotle's ideas came to the forefront than I am to the to the eras or, or movements that reflect a more Platonic perspective. Um, as always, I encourage you to pick this book up. It's very good, and it's it's very important in understanding the conflicts that we have in our world today. And you can get a much more thorough understanding of this topic than you're going to be able to get by listening to my podcast, but I hope I can at least give you enough of the basics that we can take this concept and continue to run with it uh, as we move through the various books that we'll be reading. Essentially, Socrates comes first. Okay, there there are other philosophers before Socrates, but Socrates sort of breaks new ground in uh, in his his hesitancy to put forward a flat idea. He tends to just question and question and question until people realize that they don't really know the things that they think they know, um, and because of this perpetual questioning. He ultimately is sentenced to die for corrupting the youth of Athens. And I think in addition to corrupting the youth, there's also a, a he's accused of impiety, of not recognizing or worshiping the gods. And I think that whether he's accused of it or not, the underlying premise here is that he's undermining Athenian society and the assumptions that the Athenians have held to. And so Socrates is sentenced to die. But one of Socrates' students is Plato. And Plato goes on to found the academy that teaches the Socratic method and teaches about Socrates and about Plato's ideas. And Plato... See, Socrates never wrote anything down. He was only like a street uh, philosopher. And Plato wrote books. And Plato writes a lot of his books from the perspective of Socrates. So it becomes difficult for us to easily extract Plato's ideas from Socrates' ideas because Plato puts words in Socrates' mouth. Um, and to some extent, scholars think that, that, that there is at least some degree of Plato's own ideas coming through Socrates in his books. Um, so then, so then Plato establishes this academy and then Aristotle, uh, is Plato's student, but they have a difference of opinion about philosophy and Aristotle leaves the academy and goes off and founds his own school called the Lycaean, Lycaeum. Uh, he founds his own school and, uh, and, and the two of them, you know, they, they kind of disagree about a number of core things. And we're going to look at the way that they disagree and what they disagree about. So Plato introduces this notion, this allegory that has really stood the test of time, is still commonly used in, in uh, philosophy to some extent or another today, and that is the notion of the cave. Uh, and, and he proposes that, you know, imagine if a bunch of people were in a cave and they were watching the cave wall and they were chained and maybe their heads were 
secured in place so that all they could see was the wall of the cave. And somehow there was some sort of a puppet show being cast on the wall of the cave or some figures walking by and there's a fire. And so they're seeing shadows on the wall of the cave. And they have been there since birth, okay? Hypothetically. And so they believe that everything they see on the walls of the cave is reality. Uh, but we know that that's that it's just shadows on the wall it's not it's not like the the ultimate truth of what they're what is going on they don't know that it's a puppet show they don't know that it's a shadow they don't know that there's a light behind them they don't know anything of their surroundings and so he postulates that well what if one of them somehow were were to escape from their bonds or were set free or something and they were to r recognize the mechanism of their illusion and they were to go outside and into the light and they were to see the sun and the world around them um, and how happy they would be to have escaped from the world of illusion that they had once lived in despite the fact that at that time they um, they 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 were totally engrossed in it and maybe even he postulates that if they had just escaped briefly to see the puppet show they might be totally baffled and bewildered uh, by what was going on, it would not make any sense to them having only ever seen a shadow on a wall. They wouldn't even know what fire or light or or any of the other mechanisms even were. It would make no sense to them and they would immediately go back to their chains to see the shadows in the wall because that would be the only thing that made any sense to them. Um, but that eventually if they were to get out and get into the light and, you know, escape the cave and, and come to know the world and come to know their previous condition, that they would celebrate the fact that they had escaped. And, and the whole premise here is that the shadows on the wall represent the material world and all the things that we experience in our lives. And we are like the people who are chained and only able to see that thing. And that reason and rationality enables us to escape from the cave and see a deeper level of truth, uh, and so the, these this this deeper level of truth that Plato proposes is essentially the realm of forms. So that there's there's like concepts like goodness or justice or beauty um, that we can't really know by the only by the individual. Um, examples or insubstantiations of the these concepts. We can only know them through contemplation, uh, through escaping from any particular notion of it, and that it's ultimately perhaps inconceivable to be able to truly apprehend the realm of forms. It's a, it's an invisible, intangible realm. It's kind of like another world of of true forms. Um, of which the material world is a shadow or a pale representation of something that is more true and more real uh, in, in, in another world. And that our reason and rationality enables us to apprehend to some greater or lesser degree more information about this realm of truth. Okay, that's kind of Plato's idea. And that's where... That's why Plato is sort of associated with idealism because his concern is with um, is with rationality and ra and and reason and rationalizing a, a rational approach to something that transcends the empirical evidence of your senses, the material world. You know, the the an, an empirical study of the world, a, a, an observational study of the world, is bound to the material world. You can't see reason; you can only infer reason. Um, and the more you escape from the particulars, the more close to pure reason and rationality you are able to ascend to. That's kind of the Platonic vision. Aristotle, his student, kind of rejected that and f said that the material world is, in fact, real, the real world. Uh, and it is the only world that you're able to actually apprehend, and these forms are... O the only the only reality that these concepts like justice and beauty, etc. The only way that these forms, or even like the 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 man, the form of man, um, the only way that that man is able to exist is through 
the individual form, the individual examples of that form. Um, and essentially that there is no other realm. Aristotle says there is no other realm of forms. There's just the here and now. And in order to understand reality, we should understand the here and now. And so he bases his whole philosophy on observation. He, he's the father of science in many ways. He, he, he dissected creatures and he named different, uh, disciplines. Like he, he created zoology and, and what have you, physics, etc. He, he, he is the, the father of science, essentially, because of his devotion to observation over contemplation. And so, Aristotle is kind of the the original realist, in addition to being the original scientist, um, and Plato is the original idealist and mystic. That's the core difference between them, and. Uh, I didn't want to read all of that. There's just so much stuff to cover in, in this book. I just want to read a, a, a section here about ethics because Aristotle, in addition to taking a science, a, an observational empirical approach to understanding reality, he also spoke about or wrote about ethics and politics. And for the purposes of this podcast, that is going to be more relevant uh, to us, I think. I mean, we, he, he's, he's in a sense, he's the father of naturalism, but when we, when we talk about science and naturalism, we're going to tend to find thinkers that are much more recent than Aristotle. But he did essentially postulate, he was, he was probably the first Western th thinker to postulate that the way to understand the world is by understanding the, a, that it is a system of cause and effect. And that everything has itself, in in a way, its potential. Like a like a dog, it the, the the puppy has the potential of the dog, and the dog cannot exist without the puppy. And so, the the reality of a thing is fundamentally attached to where it has come from and where it is going, what it will become, and what it has been in the past. Those are necessary components of what it is. Uh, so he, he talks a lot about causes, different causes of things. Um, it's, it, it's not exactly, I mean, it's kind of a philosophical approach. Now in a scientific approach, we might say that some of his notions of telos and, and cause and purpose, um, don't really hold water for, in a scientific sense. Um, we, we don't have a imbued purpose in the way that Aristotle proposed. Uh, but e essentially that observational nature of his thought is really important to us in the modern scientific tradition, but it's also important to us in how we approach ethics and politics, that we are observing how people are. So one thing that I, I want to mention as well before I start reading is that Plato wrote uh, a book called The Republic. And the Republic was essentially Plato's main political work. And he postulates a hypothetical city-state. And he comes up with all these theories as to how this city-state should be run in order to most closely achieve a, a, an, M, an, an impression of the perfect society or or a society that is as close as possible to perfect justice is kind of the the premise of the book but it's really it's it's a it's a hypothetical hypothetical republic and if you read it now it's almost like my gosh it's kind of like tyrannical i think a lot of people in the modern era look at that and say geez but then also uh, amazingly a lot of people look at that and say wow this is this guy's really on point i don't think he's on point at all with the republic um but, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's all central planning. It's all totally, uh, totally in opposition to what we would consider the natural order of societies. Because Plato doesn't stop to say, how are societies made? He doesn't have an observational 
uh, inclination, how our society is made. We first thing we do is understand how societies work. But Plato doesn't really do that. He says the first thing we do is we 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 create an ideal target, and then we shape society to fit that ideal target. That's that's the the Platonic approach, and Aristotle's approach is very different. And and in future episodes of this podcast, I'm going to look at his two main uh, books on this topic: the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle and and Aristotle's Politics. Those two books are going to lay out his ethical and political approaches, and we'll be looking at those in more detail. But for now, I'm going to actually read a section. It'll be the first section that I'm going to get into and read here. There's just so much stuff in this book, I just can't read as much as I as I would like to. But I am going to read this part here because I think it go, it has a fairly good explanation of uh, of his ethical approach. He says, quote, Aristotle outlines his approach in his Nicomachean Ethics. It takes us down from Plato's mountaintop and puts us back on the street, where merchants are selling and families and slaves are passing by, where prostitutes and money changers are looking for customers and mothers are looking for their children, where some men are making deals and running for office, and others are trying to decide whether to go to work or go to a taverna. This is not a realm of illusions or shadows in a cave. This is real life. So what do we find there? Some people are stupid and ignorant and behave badly, just as Plato pointed out, but the vast majority are simply doing their jobs, raising families and paying the bills and trying to be good husbands and citizens. In Aristotle's terms, performing their function and fulfilling their potential as human beings. Their problem is learning how to do it better. The job of ethics, Aristotle asserts, is not that we may know what virtue is, but that way we may become virtuous, especially in our daily dealings with others. We live in a world of separate individuals, each following his or her agenda and narrative. Moral questions necessarily arise when we interact with others, and we have to make decisions about what to do. The problem is not knowing an ideal right from an ideal wrong, Aristotle insisted, but knowing how to behave toward others in the real world and still uphold certain timeless moral standards. This is why, for Aristotle, ethics is not a science. We aren't looking for moral perfection. In fact, such a life is not possible for man, Aristotle states. If it were, he would be a god. Instead, we look for advantage and improvement. From that point of view, Aristotle assures us, learning to be virtuous is not that hard. It's all a matter of practice and learning the habits that go with it. At times, Aristotle sounds like the behaviorist, B.F. Skinner, and just as Aristotle is the original father of science and technology, so he opens the path to the calculus of Western behaviorism. The whole concern of both morality and political science must be pleasures and pains, is how he states it in the Ethics. The key is teaching people how to be, take pleasure in doing the right thing, and experience pain in doing the bad thing. We teach our children to brush their teeth and share their toys and save their allowance by rewarding them if they do, and punishing or scolding them if they don't. We do this for their sake, not ours in order to teach the habits that will make them be happy, healthy human beings. Adults are no different. Moral goodness is the result of habit, he writes, pointing out that the words for character and custom are the same in Greek, ethos. A large share of the laws and customs in a city like Athens was set to inculcate the kinds of personal virtues Plato and Aristotle wanted their fellow citizens to have. Aristotle's point was that learning those virtues took more than laws. It took building habits, based on a relative calculus of pleasure and pain. However, unlike modern behaviorists like Skinner, the 18th century's Jeremy Bentham, or today's Richard Dawkins, Aristotle doesn't rest on a purely mechanical or materialistic view of either nature or man. The transformative power of good habits and Aristotle's principle that practice makes perfect, rests on our essential spiritual purpose. The goal of man, from the start, is to be happy, and it is virtuous activities that determine our happiness. As human beings, 
we have an inborn disposition to virtue. If we want to cultivate that disposition, which most of us do, who really revels in being evil, we need to cultivate the habits that go with it. Aristotle's formula seems very simple, yet how different from Plato's? For Plato, true knowledge, including the knowledge of the true nature of pain and pleasure, solves everything. For Aristotle, it is possible to be good even if we don't know exactly what we are doing or why. The habit, and the behavior that flows from it, is enough to do the job. This is why, in a notorious passage in Book 5 of Ethics, Aristotle concedes that a good man could be a bad citizen, and vice versa. In fact, most people are geared this way. Few meet the standard of doing the right thing because they know it's the right thing in all matters and at all times. No one, that is, except Aristotle's so-called great-souled man, the man who is good to the highest degree in everything and knows it and is proud of it, but who is, perhaps thankfully, in short supply. And yet... As Aristotle notes, the world is basically a good, not an evil place. This is true especially on the day-to-day -day matters that really count in the life of a family or a community. Most people want to be loved. Most people want to be admired. In every community, there is supposed to be some kind of justice and some kind of friendly feeling. Most people even wish what is good, if only for themselves. Even bank robbers will sometimes carry out the garbage or send Mother's Day cards, if only because habits, including good ones, are hard to break. As a rationalist, Aristotle was willing to concede that doing good is not as optimal as knowing the good. In fact, practice makes perfect applies to bad habits as well as good. As human beings, we have the potential for both. It all boils down to a question of the choices we make not just at the start of the journey, but at every point along the way. If we resolve to be alcohol-free, but have a drink every time it's offered, we will never get there. Choice and intention are the dynamic elements in our moral life, and intention is the decisive factor in virtue and character. This is how Aristotle ends up with his most famous and most misunderstood ethical doctrine, that of the mean. He states it simply enough, quote, Virtue aims to hit the mean. It is possible, for example, to feel fear, confidence, desire, anger, pity, and pleasure and pain generally, too much or too little. And both of these are wrong. But to have these feelings at the right times, on the right grounds, toward the right person and for the right motive, and in the right way, is to feel them in an intermediate. That is the best degree, and that is the mark of virtue. End quote. Hence, the courageous man is neither cowardly, shunning all dangers, nor foolhardy, embracing all dangers. The generous man is neither a miser, nor a man who gives away everything so that his family has nothing, and so on. Studied in this way, Aristotle's theory of the mean seems simple-minded, or, to quote Bertrand Russell, common sense pedantically expressed. However, if we change the word mean to proportion, we get closer to what Aristotle must have meant, and large parts of his, his ethics, as well as his politics, make more sense. The mean represents not so much a literal middle point as striking a balance between conflicting impulses and choices, and seeing our way through to the other side. That balance de differs depending on where we are in terms of time and situation, and who we are. This is one reason Aristotle believed that the practice of virtue was different for different social classes, or for masters and for slaves. Not, or at least not entirely, because Aristotle was a snob, but because he recognized that our status and occupation put us in different real-life situations that require a nice judgment, sign or prudence, rather than a rote formula of right versus wrong, in order to arrive at what to do. Again, virtue is an activity, not a state of mind. Like all dynamic action, physical or otherwise, it demands a sense of balance, of centeredness, which no single set of rules can supply. Socrates had asserted it was better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. Aristotle wants to ask, are you sure 
Aren't there circumstances when it is better to do wrong to someone, say, knock an elderly blind lady to the curb, in order to prevent a greater wrong, say, letting her get run over by a truck? The decisive issue in moral action for Aristotle is always our intention. In this example, our desire to save someone from certain death. It does not lie in the nature of the action itself. Socrates and Plato, to their credit, did recognize that circumstance and intention can complicate moral judgments. Aristotle's point was that all forms of morality are situational, because morality takes place in a real live-fire environment and in virtual time, just like all the forms of the rest of nature. So in the end, we are back where we started in a constantly evolving world of actualities and potentialities. We all have the potential to be good and the potential to be bad, but which we become depends on the choices we make as rational beings and the dispositions that arise over time from those choices. In the dialogue Phaedrus, Plato brilliantly compares human beings to charioteers, driving two horses of our human nature, our soul of reason and our irrational animal passions. The charioteer's task is difficult and troublesome, he says, as we try to give the lead to the one and rein in the other. But if we do it well, we will live a virtuous life and reach the goal of every wise man, and in the course of our journey behold absolute justice and discipline and knowledge before the soul withdraws again within the vault of heaven and goes home. Aristotle's soul, by contrast, is like the bareback rider. She has only one horse, herself. She needs to stay balanced on that horse with subtle adjustments of her body to keep her seat and stay in control as she takes in the scene, adjusting her pace to the road and terrain, going neither too fast nor too slow, but never falling off or throwing the horse into confusion, and never losing sight of the final goal. Those who wish to be virtuous, Aristotle concludes, are compelled at every step to think out for themselves what the circumstances demand, like a navigator on a ship at sea or a physician. End quote. Okay, so uh, basically this is where we get to Aristotle's core ethical point or the, the ethical uh, notion of Aristotle that has had the most impact or has uh, been the most commonly recognized. And that is the notion of the mean, what, he, what is commonly translated as the mean, essentially saying that any virtue taken too far becomes a vice. And so you don't want to be uh, e excessively cowardly, but you also don't want to be excessively foolhardy. You want to find a middle ground. And like the author said, it's not, it's not an, a matter of trying to find a pinpoint of the middle and be that thing, but to, to, to understand that if you go too far in any direction, you are off balance. So essentially what you're trying to be is, is at balance. And in, in being balanced, you are going to be centered. Uh, and that there are a whole host of different spectrums of, of behaviors. So you don't want to be too full, too, uh, foolheartedly, you know, reckless, but you don't want to be too cowardly. So on that one spectrum, you kind of are going to find some sort of middle ground, uh, some sort of appropriate, uh, proportional place to be. But along the spectrum of being excessively stingy or excessively generous, uh, you want to find that midpoint as well. So w while there are all of these different uh, spectrums, you're going to have to find a spot that is sort of along the middle on all of these. And that kind of creates a, cen a centeredness in all aspects of your life. But it's not, it's not a scenario of simply contemplating what that perfect center is and then being that because again you are living in a world you are surrounded by other people and circumstances and whether or not you are going to be more foolhardy or more cowardly to, to kind of you know identify this along the endpoints of the spectrum whether you're going to lean more one way or the other just how courageous you're going to be is going to depend on the circumstances and so you are shifting your values bit by bit circumstantially in order to maintain your function in the world in order to uh in order to strive toward human flourishing or eudaimonia uh which is uh 
which is, you know, the ancient Greek concept of essentially human flourishing. In order to have a good, correct, happy, productive life, you need to hit the balances on 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 this whole host of different uh, different measures of virtue, so that you're, you know, you're adequately wise, but maybe you don't devote your entire life to wisdom because you also have to grow food and you have to uh, comb your hair or whatever you have to. And, and so, you know, it's just a kind of a moderate, a moderate approach to virtues that is um, circumstantial and pragmatic. And so I think that this, this approach to ethics is fundamentally conservative. I find it to be fundamentally conservative. Um, and, and we'll see in some future books that, that the progressive approach to, to ethics and virtue is not Aristotelian at all. It's to basically say, well, let's look at compassion and say, well, you're going, you're supposed to be as selfless as you possibly can. And you see this in in Christianity, and, and again, we'll we'll get into all this stuff in future books. I've got a whole a whole host of books that are going to touch on a number of these topics. But the short and sweet of it is, it's kind of a conservative, prudent, centered, balanced approach to virtue that is circumstantial and flexible. That is the Aristotelian ethics and Aristotle's politics basically says how how are we going to apply this sort of ethical approach to our political life uh both both applying this center this centered ethical approach as well as applying an approach to politics that's rooted in observation and in in, in empirical knowledge as opposed to an approach to ethics that's rooted in chasing after an ideal like plato does so there you have kind of the, the synopsis of the difference between Aristotle and Plato. And so then this book um, starts tracking through the rise of Christianity, the Neoplatonists. It moves through uh, Aquinas and Augustine, etc., etc. Et it gets to the Renaissance. It talks about Galileo. It talks about Isaac Newton. I'm going to skip over tons and tons of stuff. I'm actually skipping over about 300 pages of this book because I want to settle in and talk about the Enlightenment a little bit. Um, when we looked at Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, uh, we were looking at the figures at the tail end of the Enlightenment and, so, and uh, some of the other figures that uh, Thomas Sowell used in his illustrations of the constrained and unconstrained visions uh, drew from the Enlightenment as well. And the Enlightenment is is a period of time that generated a lot of the ideas that went into the founding documents of the United States Constitution and Declaration of Independence. And so un having an understanding of the Enlightenment is going to serve us well. So in this book, we, we start to approach the Enlightenment with this particular Aristotelian slash Platonic uh, dichotomy in mind. Um, and he takes a close look at one figure, uh, John Locke. John Locke is sort of, just like Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke is sort of at the very tail end of the Enlightenment. John Locke is at the very beginning of the Enlightenment. He could be said to be the first Enlightenment thinker. Uh, he, you know, there were a few, obviously there were thinkers before him that he drew influence from, uh, like Renaissance and, the, and, and, um, Francis Bacon and the, the the people that started kind of laying the foundations for the Enlightenment, but to, to the first truly Enlightenment thinker, I think is clear clear to say is John Locke. Okay, so uh, he says, "quote No thinker since Socrates dominated the minds of his immediate successors as John Locke did." His ideas were the flammable fuel of the Enlightenment and sent it soaring to new intellectual heights. But this was not Locke the political theorist. His two treatises of government were less read than used to be thought. The Locke who inspired the 18th century was the philosopher who wired Aristotle's most important insight that all knowledge comes through experience into the modern Western mind. Locke's an essay concerning human understanding, written in 1690 after the Glorious Revolution. 
decisively moved the Enlightenment in Aristotle's direction. This was Aristotle, the father of empirical science, the advocate of rational argument reinforced by the evidence of the senses. It was Aristotle shorn of substances, essences, categories, and final causes, and selectively edited. Apart from three or four texts, and only certain key passages of those, the rest of his work was left to gather dust. However, those texts were enough. Virtually every 18th century artistic endeavor, from poetry to music and painting, was governed by rules drawn from Aristotle's Poetics and Book Two of the Rhetoric, Locke's personal favorite. Politics and moral thinking, and the Enlightenment was the center of great moral debates, were also dominated by the problem of how to reconcile the social virtues described in Aristotle's Ethics with the political processes set forth in his politics. The result was Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, not to mention the American Constitution. Impressive for a philosopher who had been dead more than 2,000 years, and who had nearly been consigned to history's dustbin during the Reformation. All the same, John Locke said that the place to start the study of how men behave was Aristotle. With a handful of exceptions, the Enlightenment followed his advice. On the other hand, it entertained no illusions about Aristotle's limitations. A century and a half of humanist scholarship had given Europeans a far better understanding of both Plato and Aristotle in historical context than was possible for someone like Erasmus. The 18th century mind had thoroughly probed the political economy of the ancient Greek polis. It understood, as Machiavelli never could, why the ancient world failed to sustain its ideals of citizenship. It also realized how much ancient Rome had owed to Greece in terms of thought and culture. Enlightenment historians like Edward Gibbon and philosophers like David Hume understood how Christianity had evolved as the fusion of Judaism and Neoplatonism, how much Christian Neoplatonism and Plotinus's pagan version overlapped, and how ancient Stoics, Epicureans, and Skeptics offered philosophical insights as powerful and as relevant as the big three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Finally, the Enlightenment understood the enormous historical and cultural distance that separated it from the ancients, thanks in part to the rise of Christianity. The big loser in all this, however, was not Aristotle, but Plato. His Republic, later so much admired by the Romantics, was the one work of political philosophy the Enlightenment most despised. Adam Smith's teacher Francis Hutcheson pronounced its theory of politics unworkable. Smith's friend David Hume referred to the book's illusory and visionary rantings. On the other side of the Atlantic, John Adams said there were only two things he ever learned from reading Plato, and one of them was that sneezing will cure hiccups. Thomas Jefferson was even more excoriating. He once confessed in a letter to Adams that he had been rereading the Republic. I laid it down often to ask myself how it could have been that the world should have so long consented to give reputation to such nonsense as this. Jefferson had to conclude that Plato had always been a fraud, a dealer in mysticisms incomprehensible to the human mind, which had been allowed to inject an impenetrable darkness into Western culture. Oh, Plato, Voltaire exclaimed, you have done more harm than you know. Why did the Enlightenment dislike Plato so much? Because his worldview directly contradicted the view of reality and human nature the Enlightenment derived from John Locke and ultimately from Aristotle. The view was, first, that man is an individual, an individual born with a natural sociability, an updated version of Aristotle's political animal, but also a desire to protect his own natural rights and his own self-interest. It is love of self, Voltaire would write, that encourages love of others. That self-interest was derived from nature, which warns us to respect the self-interest of others. This was one reason the Enlightenment, like Aristotle, so strongly opposed the Republic's formula for communism. The abolition of private property was not only contrary to natural right, it would also ensure that the bonds that connected men to each other would be founded not on mutual respect and friendship, but on envy or even hate 
Nothing can be conceived more destructive of human happiness, more infallibly contrived to transform men and women into brutes, yahoos, or demons, John Adams wrote, than community of property. Second, the key to happiness is understanding how the real world works. This idea stood in contrast to Plato-inspired utopian dreams, including John Calvin's Geneva, a favorite target in the Enlightenment. Our highest ideals are not reflections of some transcendent reality, Enlightenment thinkers argued, or some higher truth. They are just that, ideals, insubstantial playthings of the mind, that can deceive as often as they can inspire. This is what led Jefferson to dismiss the dreams of Plato and dub Plato's ideal of a philosopher-ruler whimsical and puerile. Third, the only way to understand that world is through observation and analysis of our experience, not inward self-reflection. In the words of the Scottish thinker Thomas Reed, settled truth can be attained by observation. Reed's disciple John Witherspoon, who deeply influenced the American Founding Fathers, explained that we know things by tracing facts upward, rather than reasoning downward. Indeed, how can we reason at all, the poet Alexander Pope asked in his essay on man, except from what we know, meaning from our five senses. Indeed, the formal name of Thomas Reed's philosophy, Common Sense Realism, sums up the Aristotelian stamp of the age. Nearly every one of these principles flowed directly from the most influential book of the age, Locke's An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Completed in 1686, while he was still in exile in Holland, but not published until 1690, the work was a full frontal assault on the theory of knowledge stretching back to Plato that human beings come into the world with the most valuable things they know already programmed in their minds. Mathematical truths, the rules of logic, the existence of God. All we had to do, René Descartes and other Plato-influenced thinkers had argued, was reflect deeply in order to bring them into our consciousness. Locke argued that we are not born with any innate ideas or knowledge about anything. Everything we know we have to learn from outside ourselves. The mind is, in Locke's most famous metaphor, a tabula rasa, a blank slate, on which our experiences are written by our sense perception of the world. Perception of the world, Locke wrote, is the first step and degree toward knowledge, and the inlet of all the materials of it. What Plato had treated as the basest form of knowledge, our sensory grasp of objects, or ikasia, Locke now argued was the only path to knowledge. What we see or touch or hear or smell is what we get, and the only thing we get. The rest, in a very formal sense, is up to us. Because what we sense are either the primary qualities of objects themselves, like their size, volume, mass, velocity, length, and width, or their secondary qualities like taste, loudness, and color, we then have to figure out how they all fit together. Our reason, Locke said, sorts the disparate sense impressions into coherent patterns on the tabula rasa, which in turn becomes our ideas, the one true objects of knowledge. This was a radical step. When we say, this is a cow, and this is beef stew, or that's a star, but that is a planet, Locke insisted we are actually saying, it is my impression that this jumble of qualities must be X, nothing more and nothing less. So how do we know that what we think and say about the world is actually true? By drawing on our past experience, Locke says, and comparing our notes with others. We say, did you see what I saw, or looks like a cow to me, do you agree? When everything fits together, our own perception and judgment, and the perception and judgment of others, we can be reasonably certain that we are on the right track. Reasonable is the operative word for Locke. We can never be completely certain that our idea of reality and how things really are exactly fit. All we know is that our perceptions lead us to think so because of their conformity with our own experience or the testimony of others' experience. Someone might ask Locke, how we know there really are cows and planets out there. How can we be sure we're not just living an endless dream or nightmare, as in the movie The Matrix? As a professing Christian, it would have been easy for Locke to respond, would a beneficent creator, infinite in power, goodness and wisdom, leave men so confused and uncertain as to not know what is real and what's not? 
Locke did not. He was content to assume that our mind's picture of the world represents that world because he knew that the assumption works. When I try to lift a 250-pound boulder with a fork instead of a forklift, I soon discover whether my ideas conform to reality or not. I'm free to doubt whether the, co whether the cow I see is really there. When she gives me a quart of milk, however, my doubts are over, or should be. In other words, we know we can trust our ideas when they bear practical fruit. Locke puts us firmly in the real world, just as Aristotle did. He had no patience with metaphysical speculations of the Neoplatonist kind. You and I, Locke once wrote to a philosopher friend, have had enough of that fiddling. This marked an irrevocable shift in Western thinking. The old celestial spheres and hierarchies left over from the Middle Ages had already been done in by Newton's infinite universe with its mathematical laws. As the 18th century wore on and Locke's influence grew, the rest of the traditional Neoplatonist frame fell away as well. The world soul and its divine emanations dissipated into thin air. So did the great chain of being. What was left was a world of real time and absolute spatial dimensions. It was a world without angels or demons or ideal forms, a world with no unseen forces except those we can measure and calculate, predict, and control. End quote. So, so there we get a kind of an introduction to John Locke. Um, and you'll notice a couple things. His, 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 first of all, he's talking about experience as the way that we know things. So that's fundamentally empirical and Aristotelian. But then he talks about the blank slate, that the way that we gain all of our knowledge is through our experience, and that our mind is essentially a blank slate upon which uh, sensory information comes in and, and basically writes on our brains, and our brains process and, and build thoughts and ideas and understandings of the way the world work works, we get from from building on the impressions and the environment that we've received. So in the whole nature versus nurture type of debate, this is all nurture all day. Everything about us is crafted by our environments and our experiences. Uh, and that is in direct contradiction, of course, to the, uh, the information that we acquired when we looked at Steven Pinker's blank slate. Uh, that was the exact reference that he was talking about, the tabula rasa, the blank slate. Well, we know now from science that the mind is not a blank slate. We have certain inclinations. We have certain temperaments and, and ways we respond to things that's hardwired into our brains from birth. Um, because our brains are biological organisms and they have structures and they function in certain ways on account of this on account of the the structure the the neurological structures okay so so while john locke is in favor of an empirical understanding of reality rather than a rationalistic understanding of reality that that we know reality by seeing it rather than by contemplating it he takes it too far to say that the only thing we know about reality is from observation and the only, but more specifically, the only methods we have of having personalities, of having tendencies toward one behavior as opposed to another is all, is all, it all comes from outside. And ultimately that's just not really true now that we now we know that so so here's where we start to get into the fuzzy areas you know i mean on the one hand we say oh well aristotle's the empiricist the empiricists um uh believe in a distinct human nature that we have we we can ob we can observe by ex experimentation on uh on human activities it starts to get fuzzy like is is that it's John Locke embracing the constrained vision? Not really. He's more embracing a sort of an unconstrained vision with that, uh, with that approach to knowledge. And so, yeah, on, on the one hand, there's, there's the constrained and the unconstrained. And then on the other hand, there's the empiricist and the rationalist. And it's not 
that's not exactly the same. Um, but we can know empirically that there are constraints. And I guess that so the, so the, the two are tied together. To believe that we have no constraints is to believe that we are, our minds are free to, to find deeper, uh, truth, deeper ideals, deeper truths and ideals and craft ideals, whole cloth and say, this is what, this is what I prefer and this is what I want to be, uh, to, to be the way that humans should be and therefore I'm going to make it so. So, so, I mean, this is, this is all kind of challenging areas and, and I'm, and I'm trying to basically, I'm trying to basically connect these together because they're obviously, they're not the same, but my inclination is much more toward an empirical perspective, a realist perspective, right? Reality, the material world is reality and that, and, uh, and the observations of reality are how we're going to uh, structure our lives. At the same time, recognizing that the constraints of reality, uh, empirically available to us, and, and, and as participants in reality, those constraints extend to our internal world, so that we have external and internal constraints, and all of these constraints are observable uh, components of reality. You know, it's it's basically a, pro a project to try to find how these these notions fit together. I, ha I have a, I have an impression of how this is this leads us, and I think that some of the other books that I've read that I'm going to be reviewing as well, this kind of leads us toward a a conservative temperament, so that the Aristotelian mean or proportion. The Aristotelian ethics are sort of a conservative ethics, right? But though, but that ethical system is arrived at by empirically observing what works in society, and 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 the and the the, the idea of evaluating things by whether or not they work and how they work, as John Locke talks about here, and as Aristotle talks about, we also saw in William James pragmatism, where we're judging our observations which we can't completely uh trust to be accurate because they're only ever right they're only ever maps and shorthand versions of reality and we 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 call them accurate and true bait because they work i see a cow is the cow really there well does it give you milk well then then you're one step closer to knowing that the cow is really there you know is the milk really, really real? Well, can you drink it? Then you're one step closer. You know, the more it conforms to other people's observations, the more it, uh, it conform, it, it provides you with, uh, functional results. Um, the more you can say that it's true and real and accurate. So the, the pragmatic mindset, the, uh, empirical mindset and the constrained mindset all sort of work together and they're not the same but they they feed off each other in a way and, they, and they're they're synthesizable and the end result of having these these dispositions is going to be a generally conservative inclination is kind of where i'm going so um i'm going to keep reading because i'm, I'm not done i've reached uh I'm getting pretty long into the podcast here with my musings, but I have a lot more that I want to cover. So, so at this point, he goes on to talk about Rousseau and the French Revolution. Um, I'm not going to talk about this very much. I do want to talk about Rousseau, but I don't think we're going to talk about Rousseau uh, at this time because there's just there's just so much to cover in this book. Rousseau is essentially um, brings back sort of the uh, platonic approach in contrast to what the author lays out as John Locke's uh, Aristotelian approach. Um, now, one last thing about John Locke before we leave him off. I'm going to be reading some other stuff in the near future that is going to take a wholly different view of John Locke and see him not as an, an Aristotelian uh, 
but as a a platonic rationalist then now the the Aristotle, Aristotle and Plato dichotomy that's not going to be presented in every single book I cover but as we you know keep in mind as we begin to look at at Locke from another perspective and he's described as essentially a an enlightenment rationalist and I think there's a lot of validity to that um, so some parts of Locke may seem to be Aristotelian in his in his approach to uh, empiricism he can also be seen as a rationalist like a lot of figures in history and events in history, there's much more than just one way to analyze him. But but this author seems pretty fond of John Locke, um, but future authors are going to be a little more critical. So that's all I'm going to say about that. And, uh, and I'm not going to worry about Rousseau more at this point. I want to jump in and mention a few points here. Um, and then that will round out our, our exploration today. He says, quote, From the start, the United States found itself with a constitution founded on a permanent clash between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and between federal power and states' rights, epitomized by the fierce ideological battles between Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton in the early decades of the Republic, and a sectional split between a commercial-minded North and a slave-owning South. It was also a society delicately balanced between individualism and volunteerism, and between a business and engineer-centered culture of focused practicality and a religious evangelism bordering on mysticism. Clearly, some kind of conceptual glue was going to be needed to hold all these disparate elements together if the new republic was going to survive. For nearly 70 years, Americans found it in the ideas of common-sense realism. It was yet another product of the Scottish Enlightenment, but one with a firmer impress of both Protestant Christianity and Plato's idealism. In America, its principal spokesman was John Witherspoon, longtime president of Princeton University, signer of the Declaration of Independence, and mentor to an entire generation of American politicians and statesmen, among them James Madison. The common sense philosophy, as it was also called, was a shrewd fusion of an empiricism borrowed from Locke and Aristotle and a moral intuitionism, the idea that the human mind has direct access to truths that the senses cannot reach, that can be traced back to Plato. Thomas Jefferson became a convert to it. Thanks to Witherspoon, it became the reigning philosophy in every Protestant seminary of note in America. Its assumptions shaped American education from one-room country schoolhouses to Harvard Yard. It shaped American legal thinking from the moment the United States Supreme Court opened its doors. John Marshall was strongly influenced by it. Indeed, from the Constitutional Convention until the Compromise of 1850, common sense realism was virtually the official creed of the American Republic. So, what was it? Its founder, Thomas Reed, was part of the empirical tradition that flowed from Aristotle and John Locke, that all knowledge comes from experience. However, Reed made an important alteration to Locke's theories. Reed said that the mind is not an entirely blank tabula rasa, but comes equipped with a set of natural and original judgments that enables human beings to separate out internal sensations arising within their own minds from sensations arising from an outside world. In other words, we know automatically when we see a pencil in a glass of water that it isn't really bent, even though it appears to be. Just as we know someone's trying to pick our pocket, even though he says he's only helping us on with our coat. And that there's a difference between good and evil, even when certain philosophers say there isn't. Reed called this power of judgment common sense, because it is common to all human beings. Our common sense allows us to distinguish fantasy from reality, and truth from falsehood, and tell black from white, and right from wrong not by seeing the world as a series of mental images, but by interacting with it through mental acts. 
This power of judging is what enables us to live more fully in the real world, and the beliefs of common sense are older and of more authority than all the arguments of philosophy. Common sense tells us that the world consists of real objects that exist in real time and space. It also tells us that the more we know about those objects through our experience, the more effectively we can navigate our way through that reality. More than any previous philosophy, common sense realism had a built-in democratic bias, one reason it was so popular in America. The power of common judgment belongs to everyone, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. Indeed, we exercise it every day in hundreds of ways. Of course, ordinary people make mistakes, but so do philosophers. And sometimes they cannot prove what they believe is true, but many philosophers have the same problem. On some things, however, like the existence of the real world and basic moral truths, they know they don't have to prove it. These things are, as Reed put it, self-evident, meaning they are no sooner understood than they are believed because they carry the light of truth itself. Common sense man turned out to be the enemy of more than just moral relativism. Madison's constitution had ensured that countervailing interests would jam the political doorway, allowing no one to get his agenda through without facing the opposition of others. How to sort it out? The answer was that degree of judgment which is common, as Reed put it, to men with whom we can converse and transact business. Common sense would enable people to agree on certain fundamental priorities and truths, so that a solution can be worked out. Whether it's over a Supreme Court nomination, or a tariff issue, or whether America should go to war. In a democratic America, where no one was officially in charge, not even philosophers, common sense would have to rule. End quote. Now, I like that section a lot, because he starts to get to the same thing that I was just talking about where we want to say that we gain our understanding of the world from experience rather than contemplation, but we don't want to say that we have no inherent concepts at all, because it's just not true. And so how do we reconcile these things? Well, you know, there are some concepts, you know, I mean, it's just common sense. There are some things that we start with. In other words, we automatically assume that we are real beings, real minds and real bodies living in a real three-dimensional world, moving through time, and we don't have to prove the existence of reality to ourselves in order to be able to function. We assume the reality of the world. And a philosopher may try to find how it is that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the world is real and may open up a Pandora's box of doubts about reality, but that's only because they've neglected their common sense or because their common sense can't actually be rationally undergirded. You know, there's no necessarily... We, we haven't reasoned out when we're infants. We don't reason out the existence of the world. We assume it and, it, and it pragmatically works to assume that. Um, and so, uh, I, I, like, I like this. And the idea that there are all these different uh, competing interests and that in order to find which competing interest will win the day, hands it over to the people who have the common sense collectively to be able to figure out what to do. Um, and that's a sort of uh, ties in with the constrained vision as well, that the, we're not going to trust there to be some philosopher king who has been adequately trained to be the most wise person um, in the nation and hand them control. We're going to trust the judgment of the common people on a regular basis so that we might delegate sovereignty, but we don't ever give up sovereignty. The people are ultimately sovereign because the knowledge is dispersed throughout the people of the nation. It's not clustered in one class, it's not clustered in one council, and it's not 
uh, embodied in one person. It's dispersed through space across all of the people of a society. And that's the core of common sense democracy. But it's also dispersed across the people across time. And that is the root of Edmund Burke's prescription that we saw in the last episode. So this common sense realism actually starts to tie all this together in a really interesting way. Uh, and I am, I am intrigued and I'm going to try to find some more books and some more information about this common sense realism and, and get to a better understanding of why that's not a thing anybody's heard of. You know, a real philosophy, a real legitimate honest to God philosophy called common sense realism. Hello. That sounds great. Um, to me. And so this author basically proposes that it was the Civil War that caused common sense uh, realism to collapse. And um, But I didn't find that he really gave a very good explanation of that. I'm going to skip over that. I want to get more into common sense realism. And I'm, and I'm not buying this author's explanation that the Civil War killed common sense realism. So, uh, with that foray into common sense realism, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, the author goes on to delve deeply into the 20th century, Karl Popper, uh, the World Wars. Uh, when he talks about Karl Popper, I found it really, really interesting, but I'm not going to cover that at this time because the fact is, I think I'm just going to get Karl Popper's book uh, the Open Society and Its Enemies, and, uh, and, and review that for this podcast because it seems like it's uh, right along the lines of what we're talking about. I've never read it before, but it's really piqued my interest hearing this uh, author talk about uh, Karl Popper's attack against Plato and his argument that Plato and Hegel and Marx had developed the, a sense um of history as um, pliable to human intention uh, that was so damaging. I, I'm, I'm interested in that. And so I, you can expect that that book is going to be coming up in the near future. Um, but I'm not going to go into it at this time because all this, this author basically uh, reviews Karl Popper's book. I might as well review Karl Popper's book myself. Um, so, uh, with that said, I'm going to bring this episode to a close. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think that the Plato, the, the, the Platonic and Aristotelian uh, examination is really important and valuable. Next episode, however, we're going to start to move away from this dichotomy that we've been hammering for the past couple of episodes. And we're going to just dig a little bit more deeply into the Enlightenment. Um, now that we've introduced John Locke at the opening of the Enlightenment and Edmund Burke at the close of the Enlightenment, let's look a little bit more closely at the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment, in a way, is the birth of modernity. Now, there are um, elements that can be argued that modernity began uh, before the Enlightenment or the opening stages of modernity, um, because you've got Galileo, and you've got Isaac Newton, and you've got the Renaissance, and you've got a number of things that kind of began to lay the groundwork for what we refer to as the modern world. But it was the Enlightenment that really opened the floodgates. So I hope you uh, come back for the next episode and join us, and I hope that you check me out on Facebook, uh, and on Twitter, uh, I'm at NeoFusionist. Uh, those are my main social media. I'm not really on Snapchat, sorry. But uh, I am on Patreon. So if you like what you hear and you want to help me do what I do, then I encourage you to become a patron. And I guess that's all I have to say. So uh, check you out next time. See you later.